Howdy and welcome to the final part of making a tower defense game in Bevy. In this episode, we'll add the final few things to make this into a playable game and add some audio. There's really no new Bevy concepts I want to cover in an intro series, so this is just a rapid fire scatterbrain cleanup pass to make the game whole. Thank you to everyone who has followed this series, and I hope it has helped you get your head around the basics of Bevy, and you are now ready to explore the ecosystem. If you want to stay in touch with me, or share anything Bevy or even general Rust and game dev related, then there's an invite to my Discord server linked below. And if you want to support me making more Bevy-related tutorials and content, I also have a Patreon and GitHub sponsors set up in the description. So without further ado, let's finish this series. First, let's solve a quick bug that was reported. When the player clicks the start button in the middle, it can also cause the tower in that same spot to start out selected. This is because the input is not reset on state changes, so all we need to do is clear the mouse input when we start the game. Now the first new thing we're going to do today is give towers a cost. Last time we gave the player money that is earned on each target's death. We have plenty of options for how we want to handle visibility, but for me I keep all of the fields of common components public, because those are the public interface of my plugins. It's also worth discussing if the player should be a resource or not. Practically, there's only ever going to be one entity of the player component, and many systems will be reading and writing this value, so it could be a resource. In my experience, though, keeping things like this as an entity makes it easier to expand in the future when we might want to break this out into multiple struts and concepts. Resources for me tend to be more like assets and configuration related things, but the behavior would be the same either way. Now for tower cost, we want the button entity to hold the cost, as that's really the gatekeeper of when to spawn the tower. I'll make a new component called tower button state and give it the cost and a boolean if it's currently affordable. When we create the UI, we now also need a cost array. At this point, we're storing a lot of tower data haphazardly around this file. If I was going to continue this project, now is when I would move all of the things that describe a tower, like its model file, cost, button icon file, bullet speed, and everything else into a hash map resource that I could load from a configuration file. This would keep things a bit more organized and easier to expand when we want to add more towers. But for the sake of finishing this series this episode, we're just going to add one more array here and leave that as an exercise to the viewer. We add our tower button state to each of the tower buttons and we'll set the affordability to false as a default. Now let's make a quick system called gray tower buttons. This will change the button color and the tower state and read the player's money. Here if the player can afford the tower, we'll set the affordable flag and make the color white. Otherwise we can gray out the button to show the player can't afford it. Another exercise for the viewer is adding the cost text to each button so the player knows what each tower will cost. When we add this system to the app, let's make sure that it runs after the buttons are created, so that the color is always set right on the first frame of the button spawning. Otherwise, it might flash for one frame and look weird sometimes. When the button is click now, we need to also get the player data mutably, and if we can afford the tower, then we'll subtract the cost and then do our normal tower spawning task. Next let's get our targets following a path like in a normal tower defense game. Here we just want to add a path index to the target component to track which waypoint it's at, and then we'll create a target path resource that will hold the map for this level. I'll hard code in the map for this example, but this also could be loaded from a file if you wanted to expand out this game. Now we just need to change move targets to be able to update the path index and to get the map. Then with a bit of messy math we can determine if our next step will get us closer to the target. And if it does, then we'll just increment the path index. This prevents weird stuttering if our one frame movement doesn't land exactly on the waypoint, and it should be frame rate independent. Notice that I'm using the swizzling features of Bevy's Vex to reorder the parameters, because Y should always remain constant in our game. I also could have done all of the math with Vec3s, but I think this is just a little bit clearer and enforces that Y is constant. Now we need one more system to check if the target is at the final waypoint. Here, let's get the commands, the targets, the map, the player, and also a new resource called audio and the asset server. If any target is at the final waypoint, then we want to despawn it, and we also want to play a sound effect. Bevy Audio is a bit minimal at this point, and if you want a more complete audio solution, I would recommend Bevy Kira Audio, which I'll do a standalone video on soon. But basically, all we need to do is load the audio file from the asset server, and then call audio.play. 
This gives us back an audio sync handle, which gives us normal controls for how to stop or modify playing a sound. And you can keep this sync handle in a component if you want to wait a few frames to modify it. We can also play with settings if you want to loop the audio or change its volume right off the bat. Finally, to use WAV files and other formats, you need to enable that as a bevy feature in your Tommel. There isn't really much more to say about audio in bevy in its current state. It's an active area of development, which gets a little bit better each version. Finally, while we're here, let's add the health to the player and give them a default of 10. Then, when the target reaches the end, we'll decrease the health, and if it's zero, then we'll print a game over info message. Obviously, we'd want to expand this out into a game UI or even a game state in a production game, but that's getting a bit beyond the scope of this series. Also, instead of playing audio and handling player health here, we could also write bevy events and then handle these in separate systems dedicated to those jobs. Another easy cleanup is to give towers a max range. I'll add that to the tower component and then to each one of the spawning match arms. Again, this could all be in a single descriptor resource hash map loaded from a file if you wanted to perfect this game. Now all we need to do is add a quick filter to the tower direction block in the controversial tower shooting system. I've heard the discussion that this is overcomplicated for a system, but I still kinda disagree. It loops over the towers, ticks the timers, calculates the direction, and spawns an entity. It's a lot of indented lines of code, but conceptually I don't think it's too much, and this is pretty standard for bevy internal systems or other community plugins. Next on my list is giving the player money and health its own UI element. This is a bit delicate because UI nodes interact with each other by default. To get around this, we just need to set the position type of the root of the player UI as absolute. Effectively, this creates it as its own full screen canvas that we can do our HUD layout in. Now I just spawn the two text bundles and create a marker component for them. The styling can be found on the Git repo for this project, and there's nothing here that we haven't covered in the past two videos. To update the UI, I'll make a new system that gets the player data and the two UI text fields. I need to add a without clause on one of these queries, because Bevy can't be sure that the same text field won't match both queries, and having mutable access to the same component twice would break Rust fundamental rules. Bevy checks this, and it's usually easy to just add the without clause to fix the problem. Now I just format the text with the player values, and we have a nice enough UI telling us how much money we have and how much health we have left. This is where I think I'm ready to leave this project. The basic structure of the game is here now, and you are free to modify it, extend it, and add content if you want to continue to make a tower defense game. More importantly, I hope this series has left you prepared to make your own games using Rust and Bevy, and to participate in this ever-growing ecosystem. Once again, thank you so much to everyone who has followed this series and to my wonderful Patreons, who I can never thank enough. Please remember to like and subscribe, and thank you for watching.